Well, welcome to our last full day. Yeah. So it's amazing how these treats just seem to go whoo, zoom past. <laughs> and we've had a, a number of people come up and say, oh, you know, I'm just, what's going to happen when I leave here? Or how can I be connected? Or what is available to stay connected? Or what do you guys do, even? <laughs> <laughs> Do you do anything else besides these retreats? Uh, yeah, <laughs> quite a lot, actually. So I uh, just thought we'd run through a couple of those things. Uh, there's quite a bit, actually, so I'm just going to touch on a few areas, and if you want to know more, you can speak to me or one of the residents here, which is you know Sue and um, <coughs> Jeff and Pete and Colin. And uh, Jeffrey there is not a resident, but he's very familiar. He just travels around filming David. Um, so we have a lot of books. Um, if you haven't been in the parlour here, we've got a lot of different books available. Um, David always talks about he's never written a book, but there's a lot of books with his name on it. And what's, what's happened is, is that um, there's a, a number of us that have been drawn to David, you know, just inextricably drawn, uh, resonating with these very deep teachings um, and put together his teachings in the written form. And then it's come out in all different other packages and ways as well. So to start with with books, there's a lot of them in there and there's a lot of different books there. We've got one's um, Unwind Your Mind Back to God is an amazing manual. It comes from a site that they've had for some decades, actually, the uh, Teacher of Teachers site. And so that's a great Q&A type book if you've got basically any question you can think of it's in that book it's you know 528 pages so it's quite a book it's actually three books in one three books in one uh, and in some of the other languages we're actually starting to do them in three different books because they are so large so and so actually each book is so comprehensive in itself but there's many other books there's the quantum forgiveness book which is an amazing book that combine you know physics meets jesus so there's an idea quantum physics jesus movies there's a whole lot of different areas that come into this book that, in fact, some publishers have looked at and said they were interested in some of their books and say, wow, you've got too many things you're trying to bring together here that we feel we've put together so beautifully and a lot of people resonate with. So um, that's Quantum Forgiveness. There's a movie, Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, we've got there. Uh, there's a book called Going Deeper, which we might be just about out of. We've got a, a reprint coming in. There's two left. Okay. So there's a lot of other books there. I can go into on and on about them because I just love them. <laughs> I'm very passionate about it all. So there's some of the books and there and there. The, uh, one of the ways that, a big way that people find David and the Living Miracles community is through YouTube. So David's YouTube channel is got probably a couple of thousand videos on there uh, and that's all free and just an amazing resource. So if you go to YouTube, just type in David Hofmeister, you'll find him on there. So that's a great thing to, to do. It's very searchable and what have you. Spreaker. So people have been asking about this Spreaker or audio or these actual talks are actually filmed live. Actually, now we actually got them straight onto Facebook. So even on Facebook, you're seeing a lot of these talks now. But Spreaker is a, an amazing archive of David's talks over the years. So it's Speaker with a P in it, Spreaker. If you just look up Spreaker online and type in David Hofmeister, you'll find David's Spreaker channel. But if you go to literally almost any of our websites, there's actually a Spreaker bar down near the bottom. You can actually click on that and you'll find the Spreaker channels. Lots of different websites, uh, lots of free websites. And just one, I'll just mention one for, the, for now because it's a good portal site. It's called acim.biz. It's easy to remember, acim.biz. So that's got a lot of different ways to, many different websites, the YouTube channel to get to, Spreaker, you can find everything through acm.biz, or most things I would say, there's still not everything on there. <laughs> you can read the course online, you can work a friend, I can't afford the book, yeah. you can go and read it. Yeah, a fully searchable, one of the sites is a fully searchable site called A Course of Miracles Now.com. Jeff put that together actually, it's a great, great resource. Because the whole course, including, and oftentimes you can't find the course with the Song of Prayer and the psych Psychotherapy pamphlet, this site includes all that, and it's fully searchable. You can just type something in, and you'll find it there online. So that's a great resource. Uh, NMWG is one of our very popular sites. Uh, Movie Watchers Guide to Enlighten, nwge.org. 
Um, that's an amazing site. Uh, for we've got the book here, but we've got way more things on the actual website, and that's a subscription site, and it just helps uh, keeping that site going. And any funds, of course, that we get through any of the <coughs> resource sales and things all help with extending this incredible message. So um, MWG is just that's just an amazing thing. We actually what we did the other day where we had these movies like Holy Man Last Night and uh, The Ultimate Gift and what have you, where you have David's commentary. There's a whole lot of those on MWG, many different movies. And you hear us talk about these ones, and I know a lot of people take notes about, oh, what about this is a great movie, this sounds really good. There's a lot of those with actual David's commentary on that site. So that's a great resource. MMT, Mystical Mind Training. So this is a... This is an incredible resource. This mystical mind training course is something you can do over two years. So there's 24 modules, 12 modules per year on just about any topic you can think of, 24 modules. Um, and that's, you know, if you work on about 12 hours a week, I think it is, isn't it, when you to get through a module. Um, there's a lot of information on there. It's multimedia. There's text. There's uh, audios, videos. There's a lot of different things to help really absorb these teachings and to really apply A Course in Miracles. There's also um, assignments and things that you that you can do that are very helpful in applying that actual module. So even the introductory course on MMT, yeah. if you just go online and go to mysticalmindtraining.org, the introduction is just incredible. I had a mystical experience, basically, <laughs> watching the nines clip on there. I've got to say, my, you were there, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I saw it. So that's a great... That's amazing, actually. Topics like true and false empathy are pretty difficult. Yeah. And I think those get covered in depth. Yeah, guidance and trust and lots of different topics. It's just beautiful. So that's very... I've only just touched out... I mean, we've got many, many websites, so I've just touched on some of the ones we've got there. Again, if you want to know more, you can speak to any of us. And acine.biz is just a great portal to find a lot of this stuff. So I'll just talk about Utah for a moment, a long way from here. People have been asking about the monastery. We've got a few things happening at the monastery early next year. In, in April, there's a, a retreat following an Easter conference in Utah. Um, and then there's this mystery school in May. Sorry. The mystery school, the Tabula Rasa mystery school is something we've been working on for quite some time and the very first one is May next year it's for a whole month and then there's other ones there's one in September in Mexico and then in the winter I'm not sure where that one is I don't think we've decided on that yet so this would be a whole month residential, fully immersed in very, very deep teachings you know, you've, you've had a week immersed and this will be a month with all different non-dual teachers as well uh, just to really immerse. So that'll be an amazing month, and if you want to know more about that, um, we've got a site that's nondualityonline.org, I think, is it? Or com, that one, yeah. Nondualityonline.com. And all there is a brochure there, there's brochures in there, in this, if you want to find out more about that. That's probably enough about Utah for now. Um, and if you want to stay linked, there is a great mailing list. If you go to our livingmiracles.org site, livingmiracles.org, um, there is a mailing list that you can get onto there. It's, uh, it's called Circle of Support. Also, if you want to be a, want to volunteer or look at helping out in some way, you can go to circle.livingmiracles.org and that will take you to this all these pages you can actually go into to look at how you can be involved and, and help out. Um, you know, what we can do is actually have everyone who's actually on this involved in this retreat be involved in the mailing list. And if you don't want to be on the mailing list, it might be easier just to say, oh, no, I don't want to be on your mailing list. Uh, it's great, though. The mailing list is actually it's full of amazingly great teachings. And then you get to find out about events that are coming up around the world. So, so if you don't want to be on that, just tell Sue. But otherwise, we'll have you on. I think most most of you are already on the mailing list anyway. So, I 
other people have been talking about, well, I'd love to stay here. Can you stay here? Yes, you can. <laughs> you can have a devotional stay here in the, at this actual centre and other centres around the world as well. So there's an application form we have online for that. It's, it's devotional stays. Um, you can go to the Living Miracles site under centres. There's a drop down there that has a devotional stay um, form. Or you can go to our ACIM hyphen Australia dot uh, org site and dot info. Sorry, ACIM hyphen Australia dot info site, and there's a an application form there if you want to come and join us here. We'd love you to stay. You can come for a few days or a couple of weeks, and uh, it's different to being here at a retreat. Uh, we use backdrops a lot as a as a backdrop, uh, projects as a backdrop for healing of the mind. And so it's beautiful, really immersing here with those that are very, very devoted. Um, it's a very contemplative time, and it's a time of really just allowing up whatever's there. You can be very, very authentic. It's very, very, very safe, like you are here at the retreat. And it's type of, a time of deeper immersion. So, yeah, if you've got a spark about that, you can fill out the form, and we'll be... We'll be joining further after you fill out the form, so uh, it's a great thing to do if you've got a tinkle for it. Uh, we've got a Sydney gathering on the night after tomorrow, so Friday night. Uh, a few of us are going down, David and Francis and Melanie and I and Jeffrey. We'll be all heading down in Svava, <laughs> down to Sydney, uh, eastern suburbs of Sydney, down near the beach, Coogee. Uh, we'll be gathering there from 7 till 10 p.m. Friday night. If any of you want to join, that'll be a great night. That's most of what I wanted to say about that. I just wanted to talk about Melanie and I, who are hitting the road. <laughs> we may be feeling things around relationships there's a lot of people talking about relationships it always it comes up as a big topic Jesus has nine chapters dedicated to it and of course you know it's a big topic when Jesus <laughs> has nine chapters on it so we're uh, yeah we're looking at going out and being totally open to being hosted does everyone know who Melanie is you want to stand up or put your hand up or something <laughs> so we're actually uh, going to be hitting the road and that's um yeah, totally open to invitations, which would be really good. And we get looking at doing um, a gathering or whether it's a, you know, a couple of day retreat. Uh, we're sort of open to just discussing what you feel a tickle for. Um, and of course, that can open up to basically anything you want to talk about. But the relationships seem to be the topic that, or is the thing that we're going out on. There may be a bit more structure to it. Sounds like it might be coming in and coming to Sydney maybe once a month. Mm. Do you want to say anything more? No. Okay. That's all we know at the moment. It's more about once a month and possibly then beaming in. We're open to Zooming or Skyping in and joining virtually. Um, so there was a possibility of doing that weekly, even as a thought, and maybe coming in in person once a month. So if anybody, again, has got a tickle around any of that, we're open. You know, we're all about following the call. You know, I've, uh, I was born and bred in Australia, but I haven't been here for over four years and just got back a few weeks ago. And I just went to Utah for a few weeks, as far as I knew. So, you know, but the call seemed to be in North America, and then we went to Europe and, you know, Canada, the States, and then Mexico, and now I find myself here, which feels like it's going to be some months. So we're all about the call. We simply follow the call, and that's, that's what tickles our hearts. And, and uh, yeah, if you want to join us in that, we can just talk about it. We just love joining in the truth. So. New Zealand is pretty close. Yeah. Call. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's an easy flight. So. Yeah, it's closer than Western Australia, I think, isn't it? So. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> you like Fiji? Yeah. We should have a centre in Fiji. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Anybody got a tickle about that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right, I'll just finish off by saying there is this great little card here called see that? It's Quantum Forgiveness. It's the cover of that lovely Quantum Forgiveness book. We've got a lot of our websites on there. There's the free sites and some of the all the various sites. 
some of the sites are on there. There's plenty more than that, but that'll give you a good, a good grounding or a good start. And the ACIM Australia card is there to have the Austra ACIM Australia website, which is not actually on that other card. So. Okay, I think that's me. Thank you. Very good, and and Jackie's going to come up and join me this morning. Um, Jackie's been a very big part of our community for quite a few years, and uh, I mentioned last night after the movie when I was talking a little bit about autonomy, uh, about her daughter uh, Kirsten, who's also the author of I Married a Mystic, and so this is the mother <laughs> of the one who married a mystic. It's a family affair. Because a lot of times people think, oh, well, my parents will never get into all this, and that happens a lot, but it's quite interesting. It's a vibrational thing more than anything. And uh, Jackie became quite interested. Uh, Jackie was actually, Jackie and Mia were the first two to draw me down to the South Pacific, where they joined together and thought, let's bring David down to the South Pacific. And that was quite a few years ago, maybe 2004 or something like that. And then uh, they put my air ticket on, uh, on Mia's husband, Lars. You've heard of Lars in the real world? Uh, this was Lars, they were from Sweden, and, and that got things going and that helped spring me over to Australia as well. So Jackie's been very involved down here with Course in Miracles in New Zealand and Australia. And it's kind of like the resident mystic. You haven't seen her around a lot because she's been in Mudgee uh, with just taking quiet time and uh, going inward and in a very devotional time of going into the silence. And so I thought as we talk about some topics today, and we also welcome you to participate in Living Miracles Australia, uh, Jackie would be a good one to talk a little bit about that. Because when I first started coming to Australia, she became more keen, more interested, and um, I remember at one point we said, well, we need someone to help to organize like a week retreat up in in Noosa, and you basically just stepped in and organized the whole thing, and uh, townhouses and all kinds of things around um, airfare. And typically, I would come down and tour up and down the coast of Australia for a period of weeks, and then we would culminate with a week long retreat like what we're having right here. And um, we had some pretty big numbers too, I think, after all that touring. Uh, sometimes somebody was saying up to 60 that one time, I think Elf was saying that we had about 60 for that one where we washed the feet. 2008. With the 2008. So that's in that stretch. So yeah, we're, I'm very honored to have Jackie here this morning so she could share a little bit of what this has been in her journey. Yeah, yeah, thanks David and thank you everyone. Um, yeah, it, uh, to start with, when we invited David down to New Zealand, we, we had been in a course group and got the metaphysics under our belt, we thought. Um, <laughs> that was a mistake and thought. <laughs> but David uh, stood out as the one teacher who was actually living uncompromisingly the course. And that was what drew the heart. Um, and I've got to say, from that point, there weren't really any conscious decisions. Um, it was being drawn, just following, following, following. Oh, I feel. Yes, do it. Yes, do it. And the, this deep knowing in the heart, the, the calling that we all have that brings us all here together, it can't be doubted because you wouldn't find yourself here without it. Um, and so that, uh, when, it's, when it's tickled, when it's triggered by the presence 
um, then it can't be denied. Uh, although we try pretty hard. <laughs> like I, um, I, I was in boots and all because right from the start when David came, Kirsten joined him and went straight to the peace house. So there was the, although I'd introduced Kirsten to the course, she was actually taking the steps. And I often say she, she did it for me because when we have the wisdom to watch and to learn and to really, really listen and pay attention to what's gone before, it can hasten our own journey and our own learning. But we do have to be willing to actually be open to that. And there are times when I wasn't, you know, I was um, things that really upset me. Uh, a couple of things stand out. When one visit, when they came down to, to New Zealand, um, Kirsten was calling me her biological mother. <laughs> that went down real well. <laughs> How dare you deny me? <laughs> I happened to be cleaning the windows at the time. Boy, did they get cleaned. <laughs> I was raging. Um, but the rage needed to come up. It was all about the special relationship. And although I didn't see it at the time, it was a blessing. It was a gift. Um, and, and that's where everything that can be exposed in these environments, when we come together with this one purpose of healing, which is what brings us together, that is the tickle, that is what the presence draws from us. When that's triggered, then all of this other stuff that doesn't really belong, that, that we don't want, that we have no space for in our holy minds, that gets cleared, it gets exposed, we see how ugly it is. And then when we're with those people who can, who can actually be the display, can be the demonstration for us, and hold that space to say, this is not who you really are, this is not you, this is what you need to release to know the you, to know who you are. And so that's the gift that we can bring to each other in community. And that's what we do for each other. We hold that space for each other. And that truly is holding the space of the presence to see the Christ, to know the Christ, to want nothing more than that, to want that for ourselves and for everything that we look upon. And, and that's what is supported. Um, and that's what takes us to the mystic. It's that desire, that absolute devotion to the purpose that we're together. And that's what brings the tide of love. That's now I'm gonna cry. The overwhelming tide of love that you can feel here, that you know in your hearts. That's that's where the safety is. That's, that's the presence. You know, Jesus said, I am in the Father. I am in you and you are in me. And that is the experience. That's what we come to know of each other. Jack is a good witness that the presence of love is you just let it take you and you live in it and you are carried by it and it transforms perception. It doesn't it doesn't really take anything away, it just retranslates perception. So there's no sense of loss. I think that's the thing that's been coming up in the retreat. Like, wow, if I keep moving in this direction, could I lose something? Could I lose a great deal? And it's, it's a retranslation of perception. There's nothing ever lost. You might say it just keeps expanding and it keeps expanding and expanding. Awareness does. But there's no loss in expansion. And a good little parable of that was the time when 
Kirsten and Jackie were down, I believe, down in Sydney, uh, walking along the streets of Sydney. And uh, some of you know, of course, The Matrix was was filmed down here in Australia. You know another film that's in our collection, Dark City, very profound film filmed in Australia. Australia is is known for some of these deep kind of uh, transformational movies that go all over the world and uh, maybe Jackie can share a little bit about it but uh, Kirsten and Jackie were walking and then um, an event occurred that uh, from the perspective of a mother and a daughter it would be perhaps considered quite traumatic but from the perspective of mighty companions walking along with Jesus rejoicing in the love of God and the love of Christ it's a very different perspective, but um, Jackie's heart stopped beating while Kirsten and Jackie were walking along. And maybe you can share, Kirsten shares that a lot, how beautiful that was, because it, there was such a calm and a such a joy that there wasn't a sense of panic, there was no sense of drama, it was just no different than a bird chirping along the street in a tree. <laughs> Yeah, um, we had uh, seemingly believed in last lifetimes and we had um, nursed each other in death, one or the other left. Um, and so there was a, obviously a, something there very deep that needed to be healed. Uh, and when when this happened and my heart started to slow down, um, it was, oh, okay. Uh, I got taken off to the hospital and she came and it, the, the perspective was, how can I describe an experience? acceptance and surrender uh, to what is and no a knowing that everything was perfectly in place there was no tragedy there was nothing to hold on to there was no one to leave there um, and in that in that stopping the pause when the presence is fully felt there was a um, a coming together of of everything and everyone in the mind and the realization that that nothing is left everything comes along um, and in that realization was the healing of even having to take care it's like there was a sensation of oh this is done this is complete now and so any specialness or any any stickiness within the relationship could be released for it to truly become a holy relationship where the only purpose was for healing um, and it was a, a profound moment of, of actually seeing that play out in the divine, in the, in the presence of it. Um, I, I really don't have words. I think with these experiences, they, they can't truly be explained. But that was the, the healing. That was what came from it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've had many um, shifting moments too. We were down in Sydney uh, going for um, Kirsten's green card app uh, uh, application and uh, we'd got on a train uh, we were up near um, Morissette at the time we'd got on a train which was supposed to be the uh, um, the fast train down to Sydney and it started stopping at every station we were going to be late for the appointment so we went into deep prayer all right, we trust that you've got it, that if this is to be, it will be. If, it's the, if this is the script, this is the plan. 
Um, and so we went into deep prayer and the next thing over the tannoy came, this train will stop at no further stations, we will be going straight through to Sydney now. So we got to Sydney out of the station and we'd done a run through a couple of weeks before so we knew we had to go two blocks turn left um, <coughs> by a park up to um, the square and uh, Martin, St Martin Place <coughs> uh, to the embassy we got off the train went a very short distance and the traffic uh, lights where we were to cross weren't two blocks down, they were right there. The park was right across the road. Two blocks had completely disappeared, <laughs> saving us the time that we needed to get to the appointment on time. So everything collapsed in that moment. And it was, it was really just to show us that you don't have to believe it. You really don't have to rely on this world for anything it will be just surrender to what is just be with it and go with what's presented and that's why in community we um one of the first things that we do is learn to follow listen and follow and trust and we do that with each other because ultimately that brings us to the full surrender and the full trust that we need to give over we need to give this world over completely to have it all given back in the miracle, to, to be in the flow of it, in the flow of what's given. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful because that's, we have talked a lot because we've had some really deep movies here, but we started to talk more and more about um, the present moment and the, last night I was saying the past and future are defenses against the present moment. And then there was interest in, in approaching that present moment and basically it's done through the miracle. The miracle collapses time. And I've mentioned before that, that Jesus says, if you'll be a miracle worker for me, I will arrange time and space. Because as human beings, there's a, a pretty fixed belief that time and space are, are set. They're like absolutes, like the human beings exist in time and space very much like fish swim in water. You know, that's a, a given. Uh, humans are in time and space. Actually, Einstein came along and he was so brilliant, but he basically said that, um, that time and space were not absolute. Uh, up until that point, it seemed most everybody, all scientists were basically saying that time is an absolute. And space is an absolute. And Einstein came along and said, no, time and space are relative. And Jesus talks a little bit about this in the Course. He says time and space are the same error. There's nothing absolute at all about them. More recently we've had physicists like Brian Greene who, who have done beautiful programs uh, teaching that. Um, how would you, how would you talk about time and space being relative when when most everyone on the planet believes that one second is one second is one second. For example, if somebody came to you and said one second in China is the same as one second in Canada, it's the same as one second in Russia. A second is a second, a second, it doesn't matter what country you're in. It's, it's an absolute, a second is always a second. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. Well, actually, uh, Brian Green, they, what they did was they took an atomic clock, which is the most precise clock we have on Earth for measuring time. An atomic clock. And they had two atomic clocks. One was on the Earth. And the other they set up in a, in a supersonic jet plane that would fly around the world. So they had a clock on Earth, atomic clock, and they set one up in a plane and zoom, it goes flying around in different gravitational fields obviously when you get up beyond the Earth and so forth, and then they come down to plane lands. They had these two atomic clocks set precisely to be in sync with each other. And when the plane lands, they looked at the two clocks and the clocks were different. One second 
is not one second. One hour is not one hour. And if you, for example, it all depends, it's tied in with gravity, so if you went into a black hole, time would be enormously different than is perceived on Earth. Not a little bit different. What's the movie with Matthew Mahanahi? Interstellar. 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 Yeah. yeah, that's probably one of the best movies to show uh, how radically different time is, depending on gravitational fields. So, so okay, we have to begin to say, okay, it's relative, and it's perceptual. Time is actually subjective, and we know that because I was talking last night about how when you're having a lot of fun, uh, you can lose track of time. But you may be with somebody else who's not having fun. Maybe they have a, a hangnail or a migraine headache. <laughs> and you went, wow, I can't believe four hours have gone by, and I hardly noticed it at all. And the one with the migraine might say, <laughs> I noticed every second of those four hours. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Their perception of time is very different from a happy, joyful, wow, I, I had no awareness of the passage of time to I was aware of it second, one pounding second from the next. It's relative. Uh, Kirsten and Jackie have had a lot of these great time collapse moments. That was the green card moment where literally Sydney, uh, downtown Sydney collapsed. Uh, also she had one in New Zealand, so it works in New Zealand as well. Uh, she had another Kirsten moment, it was Kirsten was going for a renewal of her R1 religious visa. And they both had prepared and let's get to sleep and get, make sure we get up because they had to go from uh, was it Hibiscus Coast, is Red, Red Beach, down into downtown Auckland, to the, the embassy. And they're all prepared, all prepared, all prepared. Same kind of thing happens this time. Instead of the train that's, that's stopping, they, they oversleep. They oversleep, and they get up and they go, oh my gosh, they've totally overslept. And the traffic uh, going uh, in that morning down to downtown, Jackie had seen it, known both of them were aware of huge traffic congestion, so not only did they oversleep, but to go in to make this appointment at the embassy, which, you know, when you make appointments at an embassy, they're very, it takes a long time to get them, and if you're not there, you're not there, then too bad. Um, so. They, they got up and they started to head to the highway, and when they got to the highway to, to drive in, quite sure that they would be very, very late and miss the appointment, they got onto the highway and it was like ghost town. There, there were no cars, or very few. Like they, there was no traffic congestion, they just glided. They could go faster than ever, uh, because there was no traffic congestion at all. And it's like, is this the right morning? Like every, she would have bet that that would be, you know, when you know a city, you think you know, congested, congested, congested. They glided down, they got there early actually, because there was no congestion. Woke up late, got to the appointment early, and then were like, how did uh, Jesus rearrange time and space to clear an entire highway away for this appointment? Tiger Woods was playing golf. <laughs> oh. The whole community went to see Tiger Woods and left the highway completely open on that particular morning. So, you see, these are examples. I had another good time collapse uh, moment with, I was with my friend Raj and Suze and we were going to somewhere, I believe quite near the Gold Coast, and um, but there was, we had huge delays on leaving the house, and uh, I think Raj was sitting in the front seat driving the car, and I believe, I don't know, maybe it was Kirsten up there, and then um, Suze and I were in the back seat. And Raj was, he was our organizer, he was quite stressed, because he was having the gathering at a venue, and only he had the key to the venue. And as an organizer, he hates being late. When people show up, they come to a parking lot, and there's, the doors are locked. And there, 
there early and on time for the event, and you can't even get in. Of course, in his mind, he's thinking people may, may leave, they're going to be angry, they're going to be upset, the doors are locked. He was very frustrated and everything, but he and his partner, Suzanne, produced this uh, beautiful magazine called Way of the Heart. And in this edition, the recent edition of Way of the Heart, it was an interview with me talking about time collapses, how everything is in divine order, how all things work together for good, how you never can be late, how you might as well just rejoice in every moment because you're never late and you're never early. Those are just false perceptions. No need to stress. The script is written and you're always in the right place at the right time. Of course, Jesus says it in the Course with his double negatives. You cannot but be. <laughs> People go, oh, why does he do that? Cannot but be. Who talks like that? <laughs> cannot but be. You cannot but be at the right place at the right time. That's the way Jesus says it. I always say, you're always in the right place at the right time. Because I don't want to have all that reaction to the double negatives. So, uh, we're going along and Raj is like, oh, he's, he's steering wheel. We're going to be late, we're going to be late, the door is locked. I've driven this many, many times, many times, and I know we're going to be late. And he was very up upset and very anxious, and he was quite stressed. And me meanwhile, Suze is in the back with me laughing and reading the article. Oh, honey, she's tap tapping his shoulder. I'm reading David's article right now, looking over at me, and we'll have a time collapse. We're in the miracle. We're in the joy in the back seat here, and we are going to, we'll probably be there early. And he's like, I have driven this many times, many times, and absolutely we will not be early. We will be there. I know late. the world. I know the world. I know this route. I've driven this, my SUV, many times. And he was quite concerned. She said, no, no, it says right here. You, all we have to be is in the joy and everything is provided. We'll have a time collapse. Join me in the time collapse. Uh. <laughs> the wife says, join me in a time collapse. The husband's going, uh. I know from my past experience where this is going because I've driven this many times. Well, we got there. And he got out, and these people came, hey, welcome, welcome, and he, they all seemed happy. And he looked at his watch, and we had actually arrived there early. Uh, he, he said, I, he had this look of astonishment, like he'd driven it many times. How could time and space be collapsed? So those are examples of when you're in the miracle, things, everything in time and space is you might say it's soft, it's, it's relative, it's, it's based, if, if you're in the joy, you'll lose track of the passage of time and literally things can be orchestrated in ways where, if you, I think there was one time when Kirsten and Jackie were driving and they're in Utah towards our monastery and they were running out of, of gas. They were, it was way down there, they were running out of gas and they needed a gas station to, like a mirage, just appear. They've driven that route again many, many, many times yeah. and then whoosh, they look up just when the car needs gas and there's a gas station and the title of the gas station is Big G. <laughs> like the movie last night, G. Big G. <laughs> and they're like, what? Where did this <laughs> go from? <laughs> It just came up on the side of the road. It's still there too, I have to tell you. I, I drive by there. It's still there. The permanence of the miracle. Yes, the permanence of the miracle. They not only manifested a, a gas station, service station, but it's still there. Nice when you go into the monastery to have that there. But you st we have to start to think that this perceptual world is a reflection of mind. And when you need something, if you're in the joy, if you're shining the joy and love and happiness of who you are as God created you, then Jesus says, I will take care of things and I will arrange time and space. It can seem a bit like, like a fantasy world. It can seem a bit like a very happy fairy tale. And at times I've described so many miracles that I've had over these last 30 years that people have said, that doesn't even sound like a regular life. That sounds like a fairy tale. 
but a very happy fairy tale in which things appear when you need them. And that's important. Those miracles need to be passed on and shared just because when you have all this fear, like ego is saying, what's going to happen to my life and if I let go of these standard traditional ways that the beaten tra path that most people are walking, what will become of me, you know, is, is a great fear. Or what, what will happen? If I, am I stepping off into the unknown? Will I be cared for? That's part of the reason why we share these miracles and parables in our community is because we've had a boatload full of them over the years and, and we share them amongst ourselves and that's helped all of us to continue to take these steps. Cynthia, you had something. So, uh, morning. Uh, Hearing what, 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 what you just shared in terms of miracles, um, and this has been kind of going on in my head as well, you touched on it yesterday, that uh, healing only happens once, right? Uh, you don't have to keep repeating your healing if you have trust in, trust in God or trust in Holy Spirit. But in life, I observe the symptoms still continue. You know, like in a particular relationship or particular situation, you have done healing as per the course. But the symptoms still continue of that particular event or behavior or situation. So does is, is that mean if you are in a joyful mood or as you just described that if you are in a joyful and the time collapses and the reason symptoms continue and they are not the miracle is not happening, according to me. Therefore, I, I mean, I'm talking about from my personal experience, so I'm doing more healing, more healing. Maybe the previous one hasn't worked, right? Or go to another retreat, another course, and I, I need to keep doing this, right? So, my question is, if the symptoms in life continue, then I'm not joyful, or my time is not collapsing, or there's something not happening. Otherwise, I should also have like big G, <laughs> should time should collapse if if what you are sharing is right then so can you explain a bit more on that why the symptoms continue or if the healing only happens once I want to understand a bit more about that yes well the miracle is a time collapse and and ultimately the atonement is the, t the atonement is the correction and it's described by Jesus as the first miracle and the last miracle and all the miracles in between. So that's your big A. <laughs> we talk about the big G, the big A, the big atonement, which is really the goal of the Course is, it would say it's synonymous with self-realization or enlightenment, uh, in which the mind has pulled its attention away from appearances. So it's not going to be capable of judging some appearances as symptoms and some appearances as not as, as healthy. Because it's a merge, it's a, it's a unification of perception in which all things are simultaneous and all things are, are healed in that simultaneous holistic perception. So when we talk about symptom removal, Whenever you're focusing in on objects, or people, or places, or things, that's still the ego. There's some great parts in the workbook that, that basically talk about uh, the sickness is when you start to pull a part away from the whole and give it a name. People, that's a very deep description. For example, if, if I try to pull this glass of water out of the entire cosmos of time and space, pull it out as if it's an individual object and then give it a name, glass of water. That is the separation. You see, it's, it's the mechanism of trying to pull apart from the whole that's the sickness. Symptoms are more like overlays. Uh, some of us grew up in education, we had a lot of education and they had these things called overhead projectors. Yes. Remember the overhead where you go and you sit in the, the theater and and, you, and, you're, and they turn it on and then they start with these overlays. Yes. All it really is is bright light. 
just shining and reflecting back onto the wall or the screen. And then you can add overlays, overlays. So, symptoms on a body, you might think first about putting a little uh, caricature of a body on there, and then it's, there it is on the screen. It's just an image, it's just a, a shadow. And then you could draw a little thing, maybe like a little blood, you get a little, your red marker out and make a little sore there, and a little blood dripping off there, and then it, ooh, you draw it on there, and you overlay it. So all of these are, are just like overlays that, that are just images. They, they, there isn't really a sickness there. The sickness is the shadows itself. Uh, the light is not sick, but when we start to overlay in our mind all these concepts, then we end up with shadows on the screen and we believe that they're real. So the body can't really be sick, it's completely neutral to the Holy Spirit and it's completely unknown to God. And that's why uh, people have even misinterpreted the story of Jesus. They think, wow, Jesus Christ, he reached a state of perfect enlightenment and self-realization. And then he went around healing the sick, raising the dead, and then at the end it turned into a bloody mess, uh, to use the British uh, phrase, it's a bloody mess on the cross. There's blood leaking all over the place. There's nails and spikes and arms and legs and blood and crown and blood dripping off the forehead and over the ears and and uh, vinegar, the soldier. And then eventually with this thing going on, finally a spear phew, stabbed up into Jesus' um, ribs and more, phew, more blood. It's quite you can imagine it was quite a bloody scene. For, for one who self-realized, for one who knows himself as the Christ, people have said to me, what happened to Jesus at the end? He manifested a lot of, <laughs> a lot of symptoms. A lot of symptoms on the cross. That was just part of a teaching device. The mind is not in the body. He had no guilt. He was incapable of sickness. He was incapable of suffering. So that's why the Christians you know, typically got it wrong, upside down. They thought that Jesus suffered and died on the cross uh, for the sins of mankind. That doesn't say much about God. If God permitted His beloved Son to suffer and die, then it doesn't... Oh, now the rest of us are supposed to be free of that because God was savage with one Son, now He's going to be nice to the rest, you know. <laughs> no, if I won't crucify you, you can... I'll just take you in the end. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it's just like with Yogananda. It's, um, it would be impossible to believe that Yogananda, at his final meal, where he's hit t talking to his apostles before he laid the body and the world aside, was suffering. He was in bliss. Ramana Maharshi, you know, he, he, you know, maybe his body looked thin and everything, but if you've seen pictures at the very end, the eyes are like glowing brighter than those two light bulbs back there. I'm looking at those two light bulbs like two, his eyes were brighter than those light bulbs. And, and the body was very frail and skinny and so on and so forth. So what it means is we can't really interpret anything from the form. If we're looking to form to inform us, not good. We are never going to experience the miracle, the time collapse. We are never going to be experiencing healing if we're looking to the form to tell us and inform us about healing. And that's why when Jesus is asked, should healing be repeated? And he's saying, if you doubt, if you doubt a healing, you have great need to come back inside and come back to the Lord, come back to the miracle. Because it's perception. If you're perceiving something that doesn't seem to be healing, then you're misperceiving, is basically what he's saying. So, the serenity prayer for 12 steps is very good. You know, that, I say the serenity prayer is a, is a Course in Miracles summarized. Uh, there's things that you can change, there's things that you can't change, and then the Holy Spirit is the wisdom and another difference. You can't change the world, but you can change your mind about the world. And when you change your mind, that mind is healed and looks upon a healed world. It won't matter what the world events are. You know, people will say, mm, if, if I'm in a healed state of mind and then, you know, we have bombs dropping over Nagasaki and Hiroshima, 
does that kind of pull you out for a bit? Or World War II and invasion in Normandy and all the you know, catastrophic kind of events, tsunami, uh, meltdown, nuclear meltdown in Tokyo and near Japan. You know, it's, all of that is, is just perception and it's all part of fragmented perception. When you come into a healed mind, everything is unified. So you perceive everything and everyone in that unified perception, very much like Jackie was, there wasn't a whole lot of words to describe that, but how you take everything with you. It's not like you leave anything behind in that unification. You see that everything, not only you take it with you, everything is, is with you, is you. That's so different from our human perspective when we think that we just have a tiny little piece of consciousness that's in the body. And for most people, if you ask them, where is your consciousness located, many people will you point to their heart or their part, point to a part that's behind their eyeballs and in between their ears. They feel like, well, I'm looking out at a world, so I think it's, there's something in there behind the eyeballs, and I'm hearing a world. And, and so many people perceive that consciousness is, is the brain and is literally inside and behind those eyes and in between those ears but you know, consciousness is so vast and all it takes is one good of out of body experience which people will come up to me and they go, David, I was gone from my body and I say, tell me about it. And they say, I was up in the corner of the room <laughs> and I was watching my body from the top of the room with their eyeballs really big. I said, what did you do? I, I know, I tried to swim back, but I couldn't swim. So I didn't have any arms. I was trying to swim back, but I couldn't. I, I, I got to get back in there. This is not good. I, I should be in that body. I shouldn't be up here at the corner of the room. I said, so you could see the body? Yes. Did you have any eyeballs up there in the corner of the room? No. Could you hear the body? Yes. I could hear everything happening in the room. Did you have little ears up there in the corner? No. Could you smell? Yes, I could smell. I, could, I had all my five senses. But you didn't have any fingers, no ears, no eyes, no eyeballs. So I say to them, what does that teach you? that my consciousness and my perception through the five senses is not in the body. Oh, I say, what an awareness you have there. Let's go explore that a little bit. So you see without eyeballs. Yeah, it was amazing, I could see everything so clearly. You hear without ears and eardrums. Ooh. You smell without a nose. Ooh. What does that tell you? Ooh. That the five senses are not in the body. They're in my consciousness. Ooh. Doesn't that contradict our earthly human experience where we so associate those things with different objects that are part of the body? The ego has tricked us into thinking that we're in a body. We aren't even in a body. So when you look at all that, you can see that if I start to look at symptoms and I say, oh, this is red, or this is bleeding, this is not good, those are just interpretations. When I started to join with Jesus, um, I started to feel such happiness and joy and feel this expansive state of mind and start to feel the glee and joy that I wasn't located in time and space, that I wasn't actually even in this body. And we talked about that at the end of the movie the other day where it's like, uh, what, if, what if we never even existed before this moment? You know, that was how profound it is. So this is very profound, and the way you can tell that you're in that state of mind is by your reactions. Watch your feelings, watch your emotions. There was time years ago where I, I went to brush teeth, and I went in, and I put the toothpaste on, and I went, 
and I went, I put the toothpaste in my mouth and I went, I brushed my teeth and then I went to rinse and I spit out into the sink and all this blood came out into the sink. And I remember looking down and I going, oh, it was so pretty, it was so pretty, the bright red, it wasn't the toothpaste. Now, a doctor would say, that is not good. <laughs> blood should stay in the body. If it comes out of your nose, if it comes out of your mouth, your ear, anywhere. Yeah. Urinary tract, not good. Urine, yes. Blood, no. When you spit out of the mouth, blood, red is bad. Bad color. Panic, terror, da da da, problem. I was like, it's so pretty. I stopped brushing my teeth. It was like the whole sink was lit up with red. And I was like, wow. I thought I had done a painting. I'm not even a painter, but I had painted a beautiful red painting. And then I just continued to rinse and went on my day. Because, because again, that's an example from a worldly perspective. It's like going, hmm, there's a symptom. It's something, it's an out-of-pattern pattern experience. You're not supposed to have red coming out of the mouth. That's a bad thing. But from the higher perspective, it was more like a childlike sense of wonder. And you know how children are when they do something. When they poop on the carpet and they're just so happy playing with it and mushing it around. And then you see the parent going, ah, the white carpet, God, ah. You know, it's, these are the kind of things that happen because there's a different perception going on there from the child with the poo, and the white carpet, and the parent, and the poo, and the white carpet. There's a big difference. Because of what? Because of conditioning. The child's like, cool. This is cool. I have not seen this before. I like this. I'm going to enjoy this. And the parent's like, ah! Work. All they see is work. <laughs> The child sees play, the parent sees work. You know, but that's, it just shows you that if we, have, we need lots of examples of variable perception to realize, wow, I am responsible for what I see. I'm, I'm the one who's interpreting that. And I would be the one that would interpret a symptom. Yeah. Jesus wasn't interpreting uh, spikes going into arms and legs as something significant. Because the teaching device had been used so fully as a communication device, especially those three years of public ministry. Heal the sick, raise the dead, all the sermons, Sermon on the Mount, all these great sermons. He left, he was friendly, he had a great time. Those three years of public ministry, and it was like, okay, it's time to, it's like taking a sweater off, you know. And the ego makes a big deal about taking that sweater off. He died on the cross. He bled. He suffered for the sins of all mankind. You know, it's like, oh, please. Come on, he took a sweater off. The early Gnostics, they had Jesus off on another mount, um, sitting on another mount, laughing at the whole, the whole scene. Because the early Gnostics were, were, had part of their theology that the world wasn't real. So this was a very different perception of the crucifixion than many that were watching and then for subsequent thousands of years people have perceived the crucifixion as a time of suffering, but not the early Gnostics. They had him symbolically off laughing at the whole thing, look at that, <laughs> like amused by the scene. So that's the, the answer right there, you know, we need to be lifted up to a higher perspective and, and that's when Jackie's heart started slowing down after years of mind training with the Course in Miracles the experience was different than you might expect than a human perspective of, of a heart stopping. That seems more like a, a, described as more of a heart attack whereas this was not, there wasn't an attack in that perception. So one day, right, is that me, um if I am still trying to get information from that form, as you described, and see blood or behavior or whatever, that continues to then put onus back on me that I'm, I'm still looking at it from an unhealed mind perspective. 
and you are telling me that if I'm observing that, then I need to go back, what Jesus tells me to go back into my own mind and get connected with Jesus and be joyful and, and stop getting that information from that form because I'm seeing it separate from me. That's, that's what I'm getting from what you're telling me. My next question comes, and this is where I get confused in the course as well. If that's the case, why does course takes us from time to time your brother and it appears as if when it talks my brother is separate from me for example there's one of the lesson which says your lesson for today is in the situation involving dash 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 so in the situation involving with so and so then there is nothing my holiness cannot do something like that and then you repeat that during the day and you put some names it says put names well, instead of putting name why doesn't it say in a situation involving with your own unhealed mind, why it take it, it seems to me at times it takes me to duality and at times it brings me back to the non-duality. <laughs> and, and when you say that, you then try to bring a picture of that brother or that name or something. So why does Jesus does that then? Why doesn't it always say, it's your mind, it's your unhealed mind? Where the brother? Brother doesn't exist then. Yeah, the, the Course is written, it's a big book and it's, it's, it's like, it's like to, to make an effective pathway to God, it's almost like the Course is like a ladder. So here's a deceived mind that believes in separate things and separate people, places, objects. And it's more like Jesus is like lowering a ladder down into this mind. And he's saying, grab a hold anywhere you can. Grab the bottom, or grab anywhere, grab the ladder anyway. Almost like if you were drowning in the ocean and somebody threw you a rope, would you be debating whether to take the knot on the end or... <laughs> I mean, would, would you be debating which part of that rope should I get? Or would you just go for anything that, that happened to go by where you could get a hand on it? That's kind of the way the Course is, so it's just a, a symbolically like a ladder. He's like, grab anything, you know, and many people, we could say from the perspective of the ego, there are many different levels of awareness. Many, we know that. So it's not in reality, but it seems that way in the dream. So it really is just written, and so when he's saying your brother or you and your brother or whatever, already he's generalizing to use brother instead of brother and sister. Uh, there was a time you know, he, the whole thing seems to be a correction of like a patriarchal uh, masculine, you know, masculine pronouns and all this system that's there. So he's, he's correcting it using that language. And then when he did, dictated the Song of Prayer to Helen Schuckman, who's a female, he started using sister. He goes all seven years with masculine pronouns and then all of a sudden sister, she, her, he flips. Jesus flips to the feminine, you know, in the Song of Prayer. Almost like saying, oh yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, there is no really masculine and feminine. So, it really depends on your level of awareness. If, if you're reading the Course and those parts of about brother are, are still having a connotation of flesh or something like that, then you begin to transcend that. You're, you don't have, have that, doesn't have any meaning for you. I had a girlfriend years ago who studied the Course and she came to me one day after years of working with the Course and she just started laughing at this you and your brother stuff. She said, I'm, I'm past that now. And I said, great, because it was in mind. She didn't have to try to interpret a meaning onto you and your brother. That was just one of those little rungs there. There's even a, a part in the Course where it says, God is lonely without you. Now that, you, you know that that's not literally true. And, and then there's another part that said, God weeps. You know, God weeps. <laughs> Divine love weeps. <laughs> you know, but, but for someone maybe who's coming from Christianity, and they're picking up and they're scared of the Course and everything, and they, they're shaking when they're reading the book, they, oh, God weeps, He cares about me, God loves me. You see how the interpretation of God weeps could actually be very comforting 
for someone who's very terrified that the God cares about me. It's all just interpretation. So you're on the right path right now, and basically it's like you can, you can just start to realize you you have to kind of pray for Jesus to give you the interpretations that are helpful, and you can start to get let go of some of that literal stuff, you and your brother. Um, you've just talked a lot about the body and um, the symptoms, but could you please, you said the cat ran under the car, and then um, you did not take her to the vet, but you used the power of the mind and the, the leg came back together. Can you please talk more about that? Well, you're talking about Mo, Mohandas K. Gandhi, mm -hmm. <laughs> my cat. Um, Well, everything in, in my perception is a reflection of my mind, so you've heard of animal communicators that, that communicate with animals. We had kind of a relationship where, where we ha were mind trained together, we're mind training partners, and we're coming into this state of mind to see that everything is a decision of the mind. Nothing happens from the world, it's just an interpretation. And so, yeah, Mo and I, we were meditation partners, mind training partners, and then when, you know, cats don't usually go out for a walk, but I didn't have a leash and he decided to go for a walk with me, then he ran in front of the car, and then the car tire seemed to go over his, his hind leg, and then he was dragging the leg and off to the side of the road and up under a bush, so when I came to him, I was communicating him with my heart, with my mind, like both of us had had let go of like looking for intervention from from medicine and uh, doctors and veterinarians. You know, we'd already transcended that point, and so we had our communication about the mind, and it was all very telepathic and everything. And I said, I'll go and and get help to come and to bring the body back to the house. But I had this, that was just with Mo, I also had this with my cat Tripod, where Tripod was adopted and she was a tiny little three-legged kitten. She was born with three legs and when she came into my peace house. And over the years we, uh, she had, what is it, is it the spade or neutered or spade? Uh, uh, after that, she, we were just communicating by mind and she was like, listen, that's enough of that. I, I am not wanting anything like that again. It was a medical procedure. She said, I want to, let's go without the medical procedure. So I said, all right. So I made a, a contract with her in my mind that she would, I would never take her to the vet or never apply medicine with her ever. Um, this was part of our mind training. And at one point, I remember coming home and uh, there was a man named Jeffrey who was living in, in the Peace House. I think Kirsten was living there at the time. And I walked in the door and I heard this blood-curdling scream. Just this scream going on. And I said, what, what's going on in here? And it was tripod. Uh, I think Jeffrey has decided to put some, if you, you know, if cats have fleas, that you could put this kind of um, gooey, like, incense re repellent medicine on them. He had tried to put this medicine on tripod, a direct violation <laughs> of our sacred contact, and it would sound like a rape or a murder happening uh, as I'm walking in, as this three-legged cat is screaming, <laughs> blood curdling, and I'm going, what is going on? I went up there and they said, we're putting, we're trying to put uh, medicine on on, to help her with the fleas. And I said, oh, don't, you know, she does not want anything like that. She's, we've been through this before me mentally. And so basically that was part of her, her teaching contribution too, was, was teaching that you can live your life free of, of medicines and, you know, she, that was her contribution. Later on, uh, uh, 
one time uh, her eyes started to turn crazy colors, yellow and all kinds of colors, and it, it got strange. She looked like a pirate, you know. If she was a pirate, we would have put a patch over her little eye. But it just started to do crazy things and crazy things. And one of my friends came over who was an animal lover, who had started an animal clinic and was, a, and she came in and tripod hopped with her three legs over to her and looked her in the eye with this pirate eye. And the woman about freaked. She's like, oh my God, the cat's sick. And tripod's just looking at her with this bright yellow eye, almost something out of a, uh, like a Star Trek or episode or something when you go to a planet. and. And then Pam came to me and she was just like, please, Dave, please let me take her to the vet. Or at least let me buy medicine um, for her eye. And I said, I just smiled and I said, you have no idea. That you will not be able to get that medicine on her. She's, she's taking a vow. <laughs> she's taking a vow. She does, she's not going to a vet and she's definitely not going to have anything to do with any medicine that you get. So. So Pam was, oh, oh, because it was all her perception of the symptom that Tripod was sick. She was, oh, I can't stand to look at her, and oh my God, and I, I want to do something to help her, and you know, all those perceptions and interpretations. So no, no, she won't allow it. She's taking a vow. Uh, eventually, Pam came back in a few weeks, and it, the eye had changed back to the regular color. And, and Tripod was just looking at her like, is there a problem? <laughs> like, you know, or maybe even, thank you for honoring my vow. <laughs> it was just used for teaching purposes, but it was just an appearance. So that's pretty much the, sort of the way it went with Mo. You know, it was like, I didn't perceive that there was a problem. And, you know, I fed Mo, and Mo, he kind of looked like this Walter Brennan, one of this guy in a, a TV series that would hobble around and limp around. We all got used to Mo just hobbling around. The, the, the leg was never set. There was no cast. There was n we did nothing, absolutely nothing that, the, that a, I'd be a veterinarian would say you had to do. And eventually Mo started moving around faster, faster, and then chasing other cats and you know, just made a full recovery. But it's a state of mind, you know, when we're in the ego, we're so used to thinking in terms of causes and effects. If you run over a leg, we would say. <laughs> Medical science, veterinarians would say, you've got to do something to that leg. You can't just pray. But actually, that was our strategy. It was just prayer. In Christian science, they've had cases of, basically I say with Christian science, it's just pray first. Mary Baker Eddy was so aware of the power of the mind. There's no mind in matter, and, and amazing things happen. But they actually have had cases where, through some sort of accident or whatever, a, a limb, an arm, had to be amputated. And basically, through the power of prayer, the entire arm was regenerated. The entire arm was regenerated. They didn't have to try to do a, a transplant. The power of the mind literally regenerated the arm. After the amputation. After the amputation. And when you, these are documented cases in Christian science. So once you start to open your mind to, the, to that, then you start to go, whoa, I need to put my care and attention on my mind training. Because Jesus tells us only the mind can be sick. He never once says the body can be sick in the Course of Miracles, and he even goes so far to say, don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body. He says that in the Course. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your perception of the body. Whew, that's right there, just that one line, don't ask the Holy Spirit to heal the body shows you how much care and attention he wants you to put in your mind training and how little, you know, still be practical. If you feel to brush your teeth, you feel to bathe, if you, what you feel guided to eat, then eat. Follow that guidance. That's part of your mind training. You still be very intuitive and follow what you feel intuitively, but don't put such care 
and concern out onto the body and the world because it's an effect. It's actually the world is an unreal effect of an unreal cause and the unreal cause is the ego. It's, it can't really make anything because it doesn't have a parent. So it can't really make anything. Yes. So if I see another with, so if I see another with an illness, my sister suffers from Alzheimer's. Um, my question is, and I think I think that's what I understand from the course that I just see her whole. I don't see, uh, but is that a violation not to see Alzheimer's? Do I, I look at her? How do I see her? You know, as I do, I do I. Yeah, my question, how do I see her? What is the Course asking me to do? Well, if everything that you perceive is, is comes from an interpretation, and if Jesus and the Holy Spirit are wanting to, to lift the mind into higher and higher interpretations, then you could say that, first of all, we'll say perceiving your sister is you're perceiving her as part of a dream. Just like if, let's say, if your sister, you went to sleep at night and your sister was in your dreams at night, you would mm. say, oh, I saw my, my sister in my dream. Mm. We see her in the daytime, we see her at the nighttime. It's, mm. it's a dream, either way. Mm. A lot of people who get into dreams, they get into dream symbols like, what does it mean? What, if you saw your sister in a dream and she had Alzheimer's, a dream an, an analyst might say, oh, what does that mean for you? Your sister has Alzheimer's in the dream. You see, it's the dream analysis is starting to look at the meaning. Or what color was this? Like they say, you know, green is supposed to re represent... But the challenge for me is how to be present with her, and then what is the most helpful way to be present with my sister? What yeah. is the most helpful for, for my vision? And in a way, you can say she's just the subject of my vision, but somehow that feels rather heartless. Well, why don't you be quite honest and look at your, just as your, at your emotions. For example, uh, at some point my grandmother was diagnosed, seemed to be legally blind with breaking blood vessels in the eyes where she, she lost her, her vision. She could see objects vague, blurred objects moving, but she seemed to lose her sight. And then at some point she was diagnosed with dementia. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia. And part of that was that she had lost her, sh her short-term memory. She mm -hmm. had some long-term memory. She could remember songs from her childhood and everything, but she could tell you who she had lunch with. Uh, mm -hmm or what had happened during the day or anything like that, or short-term memory was gone. But for me, I see everything as just a reflection of my mind. She, through the dementia, the world would say that she was forgetting um, aspects of her identity, mm. and also her family's identity. Her mm. memory, mm. people, the world would say her memory was failing her, that mm. there was a memory problem going on. I was there to extend the light and love and joy and we always had a very deep loving connection but it was beyond the words that we talked about and so when I would go and visit her uh, they had her in a wheelchair and I would push her I would push her around in the wheelchair and oh we would have go have all these holy encounters and she was so loving and so friendly mm -hmm. and there was no sense of her even saying something to me until at times she would turn and she would go, Dave, is that you? We were having so much fun and as far as she was concerned it was a man pushing her. You know, there's no... So what I can hear is don't buy into the fear of it yeah. and be the joy, just the joy that you have with her. Just be the joy that you yeah. have. Be the joy, appreciate the joy. The same thing happened with her, her son my biological father, he got more into the joy of going to nursing homes and just ha feeling happy mm. and sh sharing that happiness with mm. with different people in the, in the nursing homes. And, and that's really our function. We're always teaching by our attitude. Mm. We're not here to be diagnosticians. Mm. We're not here to try to figure something out. We're actually here 
to be the presence of love and to experience all these beautiful reflections of that. Because I do actually, when I go, I feel quite happy to be in her presence. But then I think, oh, you know, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> right. Unless Nothing you're guided. Important. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's hands going up everywhere, but this, this is convenient. Angie's right next to you. I'm convenient. <laughs> I like to be convenient. <laughs> um, when you were talking about cause and effect, um, and I, um, I always get a real racing of my heart when there's something to share, when the Holy Spirit wants me to share something. But I also sometimes have that um, battle of, is because I'm sharing it, is there any ego in that because I want to share something? And that's I just wanted to sort of put that out there, that that's my battle of him, I think, teaching me to speak when he wants me to speak and not coming from the ego but I've sort of been really wanting to share an example of that that he's shown me since we were at the retreat when you were talking about cause and effect yesterday and um, I've sort of had a whole day of watching myself walk through the day and just waiting for his leading whether it be stopping and pausing for a few moments and just had so many miracle moments happen and one of those where um, we were, le- uh, um, Dale and I were led to, to go into town and to, we ended up at a cafe um, having coffee to have some sharing time together. And um, we were talking about cause and effect and I was looking across at the waitress behind the counter thinking, well, I'll use her as an example, like if she spilled a drink on me, you know, and, you know, the reactions and that. And um, then as we were talking, um, I felt a drink spill on me. And I looked up and there's that dark-haired waitress who just spilled a drink on me. And I'm like, that's never happened ever in my life. I've never even seen it happen. And as she's she's sort of freaking out and grabbing the cloths and everything, and as she goes to grab the cloth, I said, Dale, you know, this, and I told her what I was thinking and what I was going to share. And by the time she came back, we're giggling our heads off. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, it's OK, it's my fault, <laughs> you know. It's my fault, you know, because Dale was saying, yeah, the power of the mind and all of this, and I'm just, oh, my God, wow. And um, that was such a lovely experience in itself. But when when we went to leave, I could see that she was behind the counter and she, she wasn't going to look at me. She was looking down, and I just felt I said to her I said thank you so much for spilling that drink on me you know we were just talking about examples of cause and effect and I went into it and she just lit up and I just reached out to hug her just not even thinking and it was just one of those I don't know it was like a collapsing experience but also um, after the event going through that um, in my mind, that struggle of do I share that, how do I share that, is this sort of open to share everything or is this the ego telling you share something? Um, can you sort of talk about that a bit, about you know when to share and how to share, share and if the ego steps in? Yeah, it's really, that's a very subtle question, but really it's still a version of the the workbook lesson, I will step back and let him lead the way, that it's a lifelong journey of of discernment. And what I can point to is is, where it's all heading, because that can be helpful. Where it's all heading is to get so relaxed, so peaceful and so relaxed, that this should I do or should not question starts to fade away because you start to realize that miracles are involuntary, Jesus says, and should not be under conscious control. And when we're debating, should I have said something there or not? You know, and the, the mind can spin on that for a long time. It can go back and forth. I could, could have said no, yeah, no. That was the spirit. No, it wasn't the ego. That was, no. That was, I was inspired. No, you weren't. You know, it's, it's, it gets pretty wacky in there. And sometimes it's a whole committee. You've got a whole committee like, oh, 
You know, there's a whole committee going on in there. Should I have said it? Oh no, the committee goes, oh no, that was ego. You know. But ultimately, the more you relax in it and the more you you can just let the miracle come through, everything becomes involuntary and it starts off where you start to see, ah, yes, the miracle is involuntary. There's an ease, a divine ease that comes with it. And then the more you become habitually miracle-minded, habitually right-minded, everything is, you think, oh my gosh, this whole world is, is involuntary. Everything. You, you take it away from pressuring like yourself around conscious choices. Because, because as you don't hide and protect anything, your subconscious becomes conscious. And as you keep doing that, you become fully conscious. Isn't that a wonderful idea? Like you're fully conscious. And then, if you're fully conscious, who in their right mind, who, who fully conscious would choose to be sick? Nobody. Nobody in their right mind would choose to be sick. Sickness is always some kind of subconscious sabotage attempt that you're not aware of. Not aware of. So, that's the beauty of this life. It becomes easier and easier as you start to realize it's, it's all involuntary. And that those struggles go away when you start to realize you're just beholding. You're smelling the roses, you're watching the flow of everything and, and just appreciating everything. Just watching and appreciating. Yeah. In practical terms, I'd just say do it and watch. You know, if people's eyes start to glaze over, stop. <laughs> you get that look. <laughs> okay, we have questions here, there, there. We'll we'll take note. There's hands going up all over the place here. <laughs> I just wanted to share something very quickly and then ask you a question at the end. Um, many years ago when I was working in the hospitals on ward around one time um, there was this elderly man who had dementia and he'd completely lost his short term and his medium term memory. He only had his long term memory. Anyway, he was a widower. His wife had died probably eight or ten years ago and every morning he would wake up and say to the nursing staff, where's Gladys? And they would say, Gladys died eight years ago and I witnessed this on more than one occasion where his face would be shock, horror, he'd be overcome with grief and sadness and it would crumple and he'd sob and sob for a long time until he forgot what was said and then he'd be happy again. And after nearly a week of this I said to the nurse, can you please tell the staff, just say she's gone down to the shop to get milk or she's out hanging washing on the line. So that's what they did and then he stayed in his happy state and to me it's an example of the point of power is in the present. In fact, there is only the present moment and all that suffering of something that had happened allegedly so many years ago, he was reliving that because it now was his only present moment in him because he lost his memory. So that was just a little example about time and present moment. But my question to you, when you said um, the people were praying about the amputee, do you happen to know, um, were they praying for the arm to regrow or just for the will of God to be done? And how can we apply that if there's someone in our life or that we know of that is, say, terminally ill with cancer and unconscious? Can we pray for them for a particular outcome or do we just make it a more open, let your will be done? Or does it, the prayer have to come from the individual and if they're unconscious, you know, what can we do in that situation in our lives where people we know or care about are <coughs> terribly ill, or as we perceive to be terribly ill. Well, the most effective thing, again, if you would talk to, like, Mary Baker Eddy or a Christian Science Practitioner, they no, they're not praying for the specifics. They weren't praying for the arm. They weren't going, come on, <laughs> come on, Jesus, let's do it. Let's manifest an arm here where there isn't one. You know, that doesn't work that way. It's you go into the glory and the wholeness of, of love and of God. You go into the gratitude and thankfulness that there's no mind and matter. And there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence and matter. You know, there people say, well, what about breathing? No, there's no life in matter. 
we 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 you know it's it's a joyful experience and any metaphysical practitioner would tell you that you soar up in the fact and that's a fact you soar up into the, the spiritual fact and then you've done your part and it's always for we'll say for one's own mind you know if you're not you're, you're not really like praying for others you're just connecting with source is all it is and you, you could say well what kind of words would I use to connect with source Take your pick. The Course workbook is full of them. I am as God created me is a great prayer uh, to go into. You see, there's no specifics in that. It's not, I am as God created me and can I have an arm? You know, it's, it's I am as God created me and, and going into the glory of that. And also I think it's recognizing the power of, the power of thought. Um, Right before, I, today's election day in the United States, and right before I came here I saw a little Facebook post and it was Barack Obama telling a story yeah. of one of the worst days of his life when he was a senator, where he was on his flight and the flight got in really late and he drug himself through the airport, he said, got his luggage and he made it to the place where he was going to stay and just as he was just ready to nod off, um, uh, one of his assistants came to him and said, remember we've got an early morning appointment, you've got to get up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. And, and he was not feeling good, and, he, and then when he got up, he got showered, he got shaved, he got ready for the appointment on, on very few hours of sleep, and he, well, went out and uh, he looked out and it was just pouring down rain. It was cloudy, it was raining and he's like, oh. So he went out and the wind blew his umbrella and just, you know, <laughs> destroyed his umbrella. And so he got all wet and then when he got in the car, he was soaking wet. And he was just like, oh, and he, he did say that he got a newspaper and there was some negative article in, in the, the New York Times or something about him on that day. Then, then his umbrella, the wind destroyed that, then he got soaking wet. When he got in the car, they said, I think it was South Carolina, how far do I have to go to this early morning meeting? And it was like an hour and a half. He didn't drive an hour and a half in soggy socks and clothes. It was just heaven. It was a bad day and it was turning into a bad, bad, bad day the next day and he was going. So he finally gets to this hall and he's looking around and it's like there's only like 15, 15 people. He's come all this way, got up in the morning, he's had a terrible day and there's like 15 people and they're looking at him like what are you doing here? They're not happy to see him. He's having a bad day. They're kind of looking at it. They're not even happy to be there. It's a rainy day. It's wet. It's just a bad, bad, bad day all around. And then they start t talking and everything. And he starts, and then some lady in the back just starts piping up. And she starts saying, Fire up! He's, just, he's sitting there in his wet clothes, people are looking at him, he's gone, it's bad night, bad day, it's early morning, fire up! She keeps saying, fire up! And then the people go, fire up! They start chanting, it's almost like, she says fire up, they say fire up, and he's thinking, they're crazy, they're crazy! They're just yelling, fire up, and they, and they get more, fire up, fire up, and then finally goes, fire up! And then she goes, are you ready? Fire up, are you ready? They go, fire up, are you ready? He's just like thinking, what are you doing here? Is it wet? And is this? He said, but as the meeting went on, it just kept happening. This is what the meeting was. Fire up, are you ready? Fire up, are you ready? He said, as he sat there, in the worst kind of day, he started to go, he said, I started to feel fired up. <laughs> And he started chanting in right with him, Fire up! <laughs> Are you ready? And so he, he was using this to make the point that even if you're having one of the worst days possible, if somebody there has a spark, it can change the whole room 
and then he went on to say it could change a whole state, it can change a whole country. He said we can, it can change the whole world. One person holding this thought. And she was just yelling fire up, are you ready, or something to that effect, and then it just caught. He loved it, he had a great time. He forgot all about the soggy clothes and everything else. It turned it, turned it around, and that's what we're called to do with the Course. We're, we're called to take its thought system and to, and to join with the, the vibrancy, all that love and joy, and give ourselves over to it. And, and we're told it will change not only our perception of the world, but it will, it will change everything. It will change our mind. We will literally rise above and transcend sickness and death through the power of our mind, just giving ourselves over to these thoughts. Isn't that wonderful? As you can, the people talk about being savior of the world, not you personally savior of the world, but to have your mind be the salvation of the universe. You know, that's exactly what this is calling us to. To, to give ourselves fully over to, I am the light of the world, the light has come. To, to being in, at a mind level, the savior of the world. Not, we're not talking persons, you know. When persons go out and they, they're on the street corner, they say, I am Jesus Christ, or I am the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. We're not talking that. We're talking at the mind. The mind becoming clear, pristine, clear, free of guilt, free of judgment. Glorious. That's, that's, that's everything. That's what this is all about. And, and that's really the way that we're to think of it. Even if we have somebody that we perceive that we perceive as sick, we have to come back to go, there is another way of looking at this. I don't have to hold on to this tiny interpretation that the ego is giving me. Because there's something much more glorious. And I'm entitled to that glorious perception. I'm entitled to miracles and to call on the miracle. You know, that's, we just need to get into the habit of doing that. And of course all of us have doubts like, miracle worker? Me? You know, I remember saying that to Jesus at one point. I said, I said to Jesus, um, I said, do you really think that I'm qualified to be a miracle worker? I, I said to Jesus, and he said, your qualifications do not matter. I will perform miracles through you, <laughs> and I am ready. <laughs> and it takes the, it turns the conversation around from, am I qualified, am I ready, and him saying, I am ready now, and I will do them through you. But my miracles cannot come through if you have doubt. Even just, even if for an instant you can suspend your fear and doubt, I will perform the miracles through you, and they will convince you, and you will, con you will have that happen more and more and more. But it's, it's Jesus who's doing the miracles. There's not a human being doing a miracle. Peter's got something over there. Just a small one, Mike. Um, you used the term a, a little, just in that lovely story about the bloke, you said he drugged himself through the airport, and I think in America you used, I think they used the term drug or, as a past tense, or drug as a past tense for drag. Is that right? I think, you, did you mean he dragged himself through the airport? Or did you mean he, dra yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he dragged. Dragged, drugged. Yeah, I know, I love it. I love that little <laughs> twist there. Like, to, to be drug along or whatever, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to clarify along. that because yeah. it changes a little bit, that story. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was like tired. <laughs> he was struggling <laughs> to get his luggage, yeah. 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 That's it. <laughs> Just a quick. Um, um, David, would, would you just clarify the two terms, mind and consciousness? Are they? Is it a different thing? Is consciousness different from mind? Thank you. Yeah, the way Jesus uses consciousness, it's it's the domain of the ego. So. Um, so you might say, in heaven, there is no consciousness, uh, the way Jesus uses it in the Course. That's, that's, that's an invention of the ego, and, and how can we even tell that it's involved with the ego is because, you know, throughout the 60s and 70s we talked about raising your consciousness, 
and levels of consciousness, ooh, I want to go to higher levels. If it involves raising or it involves levels, it's definitely still involving the ego because the spirit is just this absolute perfect oneness. There aren't levels of spirit. Spirit is just is what is. And so mind is described in a lot of different ways, but it's described as the activating agent of spirit and it's described as if it has two parts. And he puts as if in italics, in the clarification of terms. Right mind and, a, and wrong mind. And so basically that's using mind in terms of your thought system. Are you thinking with God or are you trying to think against God? Which wrong minded is trying to think against God. But mind is also used as mind of God, mind of Christ. So it's, it's you might say in its pure state, it's, it's abstract. And um, consciousness is not abstract. Consciousness involves perception. And consciousness can be trained. So the goal of the Course and forgiveness, that's all within training the mind to go higher and higher in consciousness to become fully conscious or to have unified awareness, which is the tippy top. That's where you start to, to go beyond consciousness entirely. Up yeah, until you're ready for the the final step or the leap, which is really just a way of saying creation, because God doesn't really take steps either. That's that's a metaphor, but it's it's basically saying, oh, you're ready to forget consciousness and remember God at that point. That's really it's not like there's a, a step somewhere in the future. It's more that that divine light is just is what creation is. And once consciousness becomes so purified that you're just ready to actually forget, have amnesia and forget the ego and remember the light, remember God. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're probably we're winding down but I think Elf and Pam, I've seen hands going up, but mainly Elf, will let Elf be the last question here. Yeah, we could talk after the health question. We'll talk about that. Um, I just wanted to share a miracle about six, five years ago. Sue introduced me to the founder of the beautiful little Bega Heart Song Choir, and um, I wept when I met him. And it was the most beautiful feeling to belong to that lovely choir. But it was just before Christmas, and I didn't have time to learn the magnificent, uh, all the words of that, all that was to be presented that night. Because I was um, new, people were helpful, but in the cloisters out before the, the concert took place, um, the spiral binding came off my folder, um, the pages all sort of got mixed up, and unfortunately I'm short, and um, I had to be in the front row of that choir. And for this Christmas concert, that was uh, the highlight of the year. Um, there was I, um, unable to sort of maintain my, um, my part and learn my words or the, what was coming out of my mouth, I felt was sort of confused. And I really felt as I uh, let the pages that were all, all by now all loose and they dropped to the floor and that, that I had really let that choir down. So when later we had assembled in the hall um, for supper, um, I was quite miserable and uh, I caught the eye of the driver, the carpool driver, and she said, yes, we're really ne nearly ready to go. And I moved towards the conductor and I said to Geoffrey, I want to say Happy Christmas, but what came out of my mouth was, can we sing only in God? And he looked at me and he said, do you mean in God alone? It's a Taizé chant. And I said, yes. And he said, I don't have my recorder. And somebody, I think it was his wife, handed him the recorder, he put his wine in his vicky down and we started, another alto and myself, we started with our part of In God Alone 
and the whole choir came to, to surround us and him and everybody singing as they came so all of a sudden um, it felt as though it was so magnificent and when then I made my way to Jesse after there was this silence and wonder and so forth and he said thank you for joining our choir and and it just felt as though the miracle had happened and it was just so amazing because I can still hear them all as they were coming the sopranos and the basses and the tennis and all the rest of the altos came and that was just so wonderful that's great. In God alone, there is no past. Everything was wiped <laughs> completely. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I just wanted to mention at the very end here, uh, before we, we get off, ready to go to lunch, that just to welcome your participation in Living Miracles Australia down here, that, you know, I started coming here, as I mentioned, first to New Zealand, then over to Australia, I think it was around 2004, and came for seven consecutive years, and I've been here twice now this year, in 2016, but, but really this is a time of, of like, we've, we have fertilized, and we've prepared the soil, and we've been planting seeds, and it feels like there's just symbolically this has been a great gift and a great extension and so just you coming to participate and be here with me and be here with us is just such a huge gift that we can all share this together a whole week together it seems amazing and and the beat goes on I just want you to feel a warm warm welcome to participate in Living Miracles Australia because it's, it's very dear. We end up being mighty companions, or as they say down here, mighty mates. You're, you're part of the mighty mates to here to support each other on this very, very deep journey. And as we go deeper, it gets more uncompromising where we feel we don't want to, we don't want to harbor any ego thoughts. We don't want to harbor any doubts, any fears. We're here to support each other. And I feel the strength of that support. And really that's, that's what draws our community together, that's what drew Francis and I to come on our world tour from, from China and Japan to come down here. Is, is, it's, it's your calling, in the calling of your heart that's really drawn us together like this. This is like a quantum moment where it seems like there's a group of people in a beautiful room here, but it's actually a reflection of our mind's desire for awakening. That this is a is a reflection of our mind's desire for awakening, and and I want you to keep drawing that forth and keep calling it forth. A lot of times, as we start to wind down towards the end of a a seven day retreat, there will start to be more questions like, uh, how can I keep the fire bright in my heart? How can I keep myself aligned? How can I stay strong? And that was very much a part of Michael sharing all the, the resources. It's fun for me to, to know of all of the, the resources, to know the community that's here, to know all that's available for all of you, because it's huge. Uh, online, we've just for many years, I've just put a, a lot of stuff and we make it freely available. And, and uh, Sarah reminded me, I guess in the last several months, she said, David, all the stuff we put up is available free. We just have have some sites where it can, they're like time savers where you can zoom into the free stuff faster and so it helped, you know, we have subscriptions and things like that to help maintain it, but it's just a way of saving time. And just avail yourself of it. When I traveled in the early years, I would just go from place to place and I would go to gatherings like this and, and rejoice and then people would say to me, do you have any, like, materials or resources? And I'd say, no, just my happiness. <laughs> and then I would say, and I'm off to the next one. So there was nothing, there was nothing really to follow up with it. We didn't have internet back in the early days. I would 
go and we had phone booths back in those days <laughs> where you put coins in phone booths. I would call people on putting coins in phones and phone booths and and you know there was nothing like that. Now we have so many different uh, symbols and resources and things that are available. So I just say take advantage of them. And for some they come in, they learn about it through like YouTubes, but there's a lot. There's so much that's available. It's huge. Um, and there's nothing like the practical application. So um, taking the, the lessons from the YouTubes and from the audios and putting them into practice, that's the only way that, that things will change. Um, I know uh, after David's visit uh, and after I'd been to the Peace House and a devotional in Kentucky, uh, MMT, the Mystical Mind Training Program, was just getting launched. And I'd been a part of some of building that. And that was the Holy Spirit in my computer. I was alone in New Zealand, really. There wasn't anyone who wanted to, to go to the, the depth that I did. Um, and I, I was ready to just move with it and, and start as a symbol to let go of relationships and, um, and the world. And, and as a symbol, everything has been given over, and I still work on giving over the mind fully. Um, because however far we think we are, there's a, there's a point of humility. You know, you get to a stepping stone, you feel comfortable on it, you share it, you feel it, you live it, and then it's not a stopping place. Like you say, you can't hang out on a rung. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that gets you off that rung is to keep practicing, 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 and being open and surrendered. Okay, what do you have for me now? What is it now? Um, and, it, and it will keep us moving along. Um, and, and that mystical mind training program, when I, uh, every time there was a question, I would open my computer, and the answer was right there. It's practical. There, there are assignments, there are videos, there are um, tasks to do which keep the mind focused on the spirit. Whatever you seem to be doing, you can, you can call on the spirit and in every moment when, you've, when you have that support, it's the mighty mate that's there. And we have community now. Come and stay with us. You're invited. You know, we love it. You're a gift to us whenever you come. It's it's a divine, divine place in the heart when you come and join us. We love it. So do know that we're here and that we invite you to come learn what we do. Come live with us. Just see how it works. Okay.